Um, thank you so much, Christian, for the intro, and thank you, New Relic, for bringing me here. I'm really, really excited to be speaking. Um, this, you have wandered into Programmers Can UX 2 subtitle, Avoiding the Programmer's User Interface. So, I'm Erin. It's nice to meet you. I look like that. Um, and I make websites. So, I'm not a UX professional, like at all. Like, i not even a designer. And actually, the only reason I have slides that look nice, like at all, I that look nice is because my coworker saw my original slides and was just like, I'm going to make you new slides, um, which I'm super grateful for. But no, I am in no way like trained to do anything visual. I am a programmer. So I work on the back end. I'm a PHP programmer. And I have done pretty much I have back end. So, well, my whole professional life. Um, I work at a company in Minneapolis called Clockwork. We are an interactive agency, which means that we kind of solve whatever problems our clients bring to us. So I've worked on everything from e-commerce, online promotions, really promotions, content heavy sizes that have to be served up more through algorithm and search than through just a page tree. I've also worked on brochure sites with page trees. Um, but at the end of the day, our software is really good, I think. And we use semantic HTML. We've got best practices. We have a very modern version of PHP running on our very secure PCI compliant servers and all of those really important things. But that's not why our software is good. Uh, and it's not what makes good software. What makes good software, uh, oops, sorry. What makes good software for us, I gave away the punchline, I'm so disappointed. Um, <laughs> is that we put the user first through the entire process. So from requirements gathering, through implementation, even during QA writing the test plan, the entire time, the, the entire of those processes is the user. So I'm gonna propose a definition of good software that I'm gonna sort of use for the talk today. Good software is software that people want to use and want to keep using. And I can hear some of you already thinking, well, what about security? And what about speed? And what about very, very exciting, cool algorithms that I just learned about at a conference last week? And to you, I say, those are actually kind of incorporated in this definition, mostly. Because if your software is fast, well, that makes software that people want to use. And if your software is secure, then that makes software that people want to use because if it's not, no one will want to use it then that, that people want to use. If your software uses very exciting algorithms, I agree, that's super fun. That's what I dig too. But if it doesn't actually make the software something that people want to use more, if it doesn't impact the user's experience, it's experience, programming for programming's sake. But it doesn't make the software better. So why am I giving this talk? Instead of some news you know, actually qualified. Um, I'm giving this talk for the same reason, you know, actually qualified. Um, I'm getting excited that you're here because I think that programmers need to start caring about interfaces. I think that people who are in the ones and the zeros, on the technical code, on the back end even, need to care very strongly about the interfaces that we write. It's gonna make us write better software. That's why we're here, right? Like you don't go to extracurricular software talks if you don't wanna write better software. It's gonna make our users happier too, happier too. And although it will be harder than what you're currently doing, if this isn't already how you're approaching things, I think it won't be as hard as you think. So I'm gonna to use today to get you on board with this idea and give you some tools to kind of make it happen. So what is that idea? The idea that the best software happens when everyone on the team feels ownership of the user interface. It is not just one person's job. It's something we all have a right to care about and a responsibility to care about. So if you think this stuff in silo, this stuff in silo, sit down, we're done with that, not happening today. So from one dev to another, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to demystify UX. I'm gonna give you a little bit of the, the training that I, I do have, which is, you know, not a ton, but I've got some. I'm slightly qualified to give this talk. 
Um, and I'm going to give you tools you can use while you code. And I'm, only, I'm also going to prove not only that you should, but that you can, basically. So non-programmers, if we have any of you, I'm going to be up front. I'm going to use all of the words wrong. I'm going to probably say things that make your hair stand on end and that you were talking about 10 years ago, and you'll wonder why we're just talking about this now. So if that is you, you've already had your pizza, and you can leave, and that's cool. No hard feelings. Uh, but what I do hope that you might get out of this, if you are more of a, a non-software kind of type, more of a, of a, a non-software of a design, this is how programmers think about software. Think about software. Approach it. This is so I hope that this gives you the tools to have a conversation that goes both ways and maybe meet us where we're at a little more clearly so we can make software together. So today we're going to talk about, in no particular order, well, that didn't work, practical ways to make your users' experiences better, how to work with the UX professional in your life, and some red flags or code smells for when your UI needs a little bit of love. So first, why do we care? Let's start with a survey. How many people here write significantly like front-end code, like CSS, HTML, JavaScript, that's kind of your bag? Okay. How many of you are more like server-side, PHP, Ruby, Python, databases, that stuff? Uh, cool. This option's not on there, but how many of you are kind of DevOpsy? I get a feeling that that might be this crowd. So you're not really writing code code per se. You're supporting the code code. Okay. Um, how many of you are mobile? Because I don't know, you like do both of them, and that's super weird to me. But you're writing the interfaces in the back end. Okay, and then finally, is there anybody here who just isn't really a coder? You're, you're here to kind of get exposed to that. Sweet. Okay. Well, anyway, back to the... The first part of that back end, that's kind of the first part of kind of the traditional sort of say, well, I work in the browser, or I work on the server, or I work. If you are a front end person, you might be uh, implementing requirements someone else gave to you. You might be even doing the design yourself and kind of thinking about that stuff. And so that's good. At least you're thinking about that's at least you're thinking about to some degree you're in the front end. Um, Backend folks, on the other hand, I know that for us, like the user feels super far away because what we're doing is classes, tables, algorithms, caching. We're doing all sorts of stuff that is just obviously a means to an end, but not directly interacting with the user. And so it's easy to feel like we're really far away from it. Um, I know that I get very excited every time I go to a conference, and I know how to rewrite all of my code, to use dependency injection, to automatedly test everything, and then I don't even have to use it. So uh, that's all very exciting. But here's the deal, spoiler alert. If no one can use your software, nobody cares about your software. So they might suffer through it, but they're not gonna be happy. And the moment they have the option to use something else, they will. This is something that I actually have some experience with because I used to work at a company that we were pretty much the only people in our field. And our technical solution was solid. Like, it was a good product. Our interfaces were really, really embarrassingly bad. Like, there were frames involved until 2009. It was, yeah, right? <laughs> it was a problem. But we were the only people doing what we did. And so people dealt with it. But it made it really easy for competitors to roll up and not be able to touch the actual product in terms of algorithms and features that we were offering, but they looked a lot better than us. But they better than us and theirs. And we scramble to at least get a little bit better so that we could go back and say, no, 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 come back to us. So on the one hand, it was really frustrating because we knew that we had a better product. We knew it, so to speak. We knew we didn't have the features. We knew we couldn't be matched. But the user's experience is a very real thing. And our problem was that we only looked at the data. We only thought about the data that we were collecting for them and how we were processing it and spitting it back out again. What we needed to be thinking of it back out again. What we to be thinking about was something. So don't let yourself rest on your laurels if you say, well, the back end's great, front end, whatever. It does what you need. It's very easy for someone to swoop in, make you look bad, steal your people, and it won't be hard for them to do it. So, 
Before I said why me, now I say why us. I, I think it said not only should you, uh, I think you can. So think about it this way. One does not wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a beer nerd. Actually, maybe you do. I'm going to be a beer nerd. Actually, maybe you do, because we're important different <laughs> than the rest of the country. Uh, but I'm going to assume that your college students are just as broke as everybody else's college students. So what actually happens is you go to college, and you have zero money, and you buy a case of Bush Light because it is the thing you can afford. Um, and then sometimes you're like celebrating, so you get some lineys and you feel like really classy. And and you <laughs> it hurts me to say. It hurts me to say. I know it hurt you to hear. Um, and you you just keep drinking it, and then eventually you're like, okay. I'm going to go with a little bit of quality over quantity. And gradually, as you get more familiar, more exposed to it, you start to develop opinions. You start to get better at beer. And eventually, you're talking about IPAs versus lager and what kind of hops and is it dry or wet and all these things. But you don't start there. That's too much. It's just too much. It's just similarly, if you watch enough reality television, I promise one day you'll care who wins Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> it is merely an issue of what you're exposed to and how, how much of that you take in where you start to get qualified to have opinions on it. So if you think of it that way, we are incredibly qualified to do UX because we use more software than anybody. Software than anybody. We use 20 different softwares at work every day. PHP, Vim, Facebook. Um, <laughs> you know, and, that, and then I go home and then it's Hulu and it's Netflix and it's the server that I'm setting up to stream things from my living room to my bedroom because I'm too lazy to put it on a little USB key and do it like normal people. Um, but I'm, I, we use more software than anyone. So by that standard, we're completely qualified to have opinions, opinions on how software ought to work. We do it all day, every day. We do it more than anybody else. So earlier, I said everyone on the team should feel ownership. And that's absolutely true. But programmers are special little snowflakes in this, in that we get to feel a little more ownership because not only are we on the team and, and being involved in this, but we are the ones who actually make software. So I'm going to give you an analogy while I walk to get my water. Sorry, camera. Um, think about a, a composer. And for PHP people, I don't mean the thing. And for PHP people, that manages your packages uh, music. So a composer makes music. Nearly all composers can play the piano. It's not because the piano is the best instrument ever or because they all just statistically defy and think piano's great. It's because the piano is the ultimate musical prototyping tool. So they're able to get their ideas out without resorting to just writing it down. I mean, they could just write sheet music, but that's not very useful. But the piano, they can get their ideas across. It doesn't have to be their main instrument, but they can use it. Similarly, the interface is your prototype. The interface is your interface is how you're going your beautiful, beautiful software to the user. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't have users, so ha ha. <laughs> That's not true. All software has users. Even APIs, even internal tools, even bash utilities. Twilio, for example, they are bash utilities. For example, they are butts sitting in this. And I think a big part of that is they have a developer experience team. They have people whose jobs it is to, just like we have user experience for our websites, Twilio has developer experience to make their APIs nice to use. And I think that's going a long way towards them <laughs> being used by so many people. So there's room to care about experience, even if your users don't look like capital U sit down at a keyboard with a mouse users. All software is getting used. It just matters by who. So what is the programmer's interface? Subtitle from the beginning of the talk. I apologize for what's about to happen. It's that. And it's that. And I, I love Linux, but it's that. And it is that. Uh, it is something no one set out to do. Like, no one thought that was a good idea. No one sat down and was like, this is it. It just happened. It just happened to them. This, I, you probably can't even tell. This renames files. <laughs> so, 
which I dis I've said that a dozen times at this point. I still barely believe it every time. This renames files, and I'm sure when it started, it was a completely reasonable tool. I'm sure it had like a field that you typed a name in and another field where you picked a file. But then what happened was somebody else came by and said, oh, hey, dude, if you expose the, uh, uh, like a, you know, this variable on there, if you let me do some copies when I'm doing this, then I can solve this other problem I have. The programmer's like, you're right, good idea. I can do that, no big deal. So they add it. Now you have another little box. Then someone else comes by and they say, hey, if you can do reg regular expressions, I can solve this other problem. And then the programmer said, well, that's true. And writing regular expression parser never got anybody into trouble, so let's do it. So now you've got another little box. And then the boss came by and said, okay, the client wants this. And the programmer said to that, well, that one doesn't make a ton of sense. And the boss said, I don't really care. Uh, the client wants this. And so now another box got added. And eventually what you have is that. You have a front end that explains very clearly how the code underneath is working. Code underneath is working. I mean, you can look at the tell variables are named in the code. You could tell if this had database tables, you'd know exactly what fields are in which tables and how they relate. So the programmer's interface is an interface where the front end looks a whole lot like a back end. It's an interface where there's very little abstraction between how the programmer is thinking and what the user is trying to accomplish. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it gives a visual to scope creep. I put this slide in there because I used to not have a slide and then people like came up to me afterwards and they're like, it's really disturbing. It is actually very distracting. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Some otters. Um, <laughs> I'm showing you these, these terrible pictures, though, to prove that you are not inherently bad at UX. There's nothing about you as a programmer that makes you incapable of this. It's just our process. It's something that happens to us. It's the way we make software and the fact that nobody ever told us that it could be better. You can be better. So, how? First concept that's really important here when believing that you can do it is a concept of negative taste and positive taste. So this is from an essay um, by Aaron Schwartz, who was uh, one of the founders of Reddit. In it, he defines negative taste and positive taste. So positive taste is kind of what we think of as taste. It's, it's what your creatives have at work. They can look at a blank canvas and they can make a thing out of it, which is magic as far as I'm concerned. But Reality is that's kind of a learned skill. They go to school for that. There are a lot of principles that they apply about grouping and sizing and placement and perspective and colors and things like that. Negative taste is actually harder to teach. Negative taste is the ability to look at something and say, that sucks, but I don't know how to fix it. That's something that most of us have. Most of you looked, I hope, looked at those pictures and said, that was awful. I don't know how to fix it, I don't know how it got that way, but I know that was bad. That's a thing that you just get through exposure. That's the thing you get from drinking a lot of beer and watching Dancing with the Stars. Just this exposure to things that gives you a sense of like, that's bad. Once you have that, you can learn how to have positive taste. Then it just becomes a matter of applying the principles to the situations that trigger your little like, eh, I don't like it. So what I'm gonna to do today is talk to you about some of those principles. How can we do better? Programmer's interface happens when you try to design an interface at the same time that you're writing it. So this is when we forget that users don't know as much as us about set theory, Boolean logic, forms even. If users hate forms, they're like really bad at them, which is, sort of unthinkable to us because that's like literally how you accomplish anything on the internet. Users hate forms, they freak them out. There's lots of data that says this. So when you already have that kind of fundamental disconnect, it's easy to forget that we are really different from our users. It also comes from thinking more about your backend implementation, how you're going to solve the problem, than thinking about how someone's going to use the tool that you're writing to solve it. So it's more than about the back end than about the use case. Most often though, 
and we can all cop to this. It happens when you realize that writing the right solution would be kind of hard. It's going to take longer to implement what you should do. And this starts really small. Sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's like not even. Like you just have a deadline tomorrow and you're writing a CSV importer and you're mapping all the fields one to one and you realize that, you know, if I make them put month, day, year in different columns, then I don't have to do anything special in the back end to handle that special case. And that's not that big a deal. So that's how you implement it. And from there it trickles down. Because then you start going, oh, I don't even think they need a date picker. They know how to type dates. NBD, no big deal. And then you get like on this really fast train all the way to Ugly Town, where you don't even know how it happened, but suddenly you're renaming files with a thing that looks like that. You don't even know how you're renaming. It starts, it just starts from cutting corners. The way that we're going to fix that, we're going to do our UX first. It's that simple. I firmly believe in thinking about your use cases before you start thinking about the back end which I think is hard for a lot of programmers. I think for a lot of us, we immediately go to, the, to thinking about the data. Like that's sort of what we're dealing with in the back end, especially in the web. If you're doing something with a database, you're kind of constructing the tables. You want to make sure you catch everything in the web, doing something with the data, make sure you catch everything, where it's going to sit and what it's going to look like. Take a step back, man. Take a step back. Think about what people need to accomplish. Think about what it is they need to get done. And the reason for this is not only does it make better looking software, I promise you it does, it's going to keep you from doing unnecessary work. When you go database first, it is way too easy to fall down this rabbit hole of, oh, but I'll leave this open for future extensibility and then I'll have, be able to add this on if anyone needs it and also have be able to needs it and also needs that stuff. Step back, figure out your use cases, go from there. You're also going to need to do UX third and fifth and seventh and ninth and every odd number from there on out because you won't get it right the first time. That's okay. That's not you. That's just reality. That's the fact that you're going to sit down and try to write something and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be a masterpiece. Every user everywhere will ever, always want to use this thing to get their software done. And then you go and sit down to write it and you realize you have designed something completely impossible. Or you to write it and you realize you have done impossible. On the data restoring this it just makes that impractical or you wrote an interface design that's going to take like 100 hours to implement and not really worth it so we have to go back to the drawing board so at that point you have two choices you can either kind of think of something on the fly and keep writing and move on or you can stop programming step away i literally physically move into another room that has a whiteboard and no laptop and you whiteboard it out again and you think about how are we going to solve this problem using these new constraints that I know about. If you take that step back, if you give yourself that space to think, you get out of a headspace where you're shortchanging yourself. You get out of a headspace where you're going, oh my God, I know what would be right, but it's so hard to write. I don't want to do that. I don't even know how to think about this problem without thinking about the JavaScript libraries that I'll need to do it. You just got to take a step back and say, okay, user hat. What does the user need? Try not to think about how hard it'll be to write. And granted, all software has compromises. At some point, you are going to have to like do the horse trading and say, okay, what are we actually going to implement? But in general, in the general case, you need to take that step back. You need to give yourself space to think. So this kind of ties into my last buzzword, I promise. This concept called user-centered design. It's a process in which the needs wants and limitations of the end users of a product are given extensive attention at each stage of the design process. In other words, it's what I said Clockwork does. It's what my company does. It's how we make software. Um, it's where you get your UX first, third, fifth, ninth from. It looks like this. You start out at the top of the circle analyzing UX first. What, what's our problem? What are we trying to solve? You move into design where you try to get an idea of how to, how to solve that. Then you implement it. So we have two steps before we're even writing any code. Move into implementation, and then you send it out in the world for validation. Once, once people are actually using it and you're getting a sense of like, how's this working? Do people use it? What are my conversions like? Can anyone handle it? Is it ugly? Then you come back up and you analyze all of the information you've gathered by throwing it out into the world. And it all starts again. And this is kind of the beauty of the web is that we can do this. Like we're no longer tethered to this desktop model of like one release every six months. 
Like I barely even remember what that's like, you know? It's, it's this process where we can iterate pretty quickly. The other nice thing about this is it doesn't have to only look like a launch. Validation doesn't have to be your end users, the final people using your software. It can be your coworker. It can be someone in the hallway. It can be your mom. It can be a lot of people before you even get to that step. And your software will be stronger for it too. So this iterative circular path, wait, I'm facing the other way. The iterative circular path <laughs> that you go through is going to let you refine your software. It also takes the, the burden off of getting it right the first time. Because that's like a lot of pressure. And you're not going to. So don't pretend you will. Just write a thing. Allow yourself permission to fail at it. Once you see how you failed, because you did, then go back and fix just that. Don't try to solve everything up front. It won't work. So going to dive into a little bit of, of theory on some of this stuff. This is the uh, hardcore UX educational portion of this talk. I'm going to give you some tactics, some very specific things that you can use while you're going through the code, while you're writing this stuff. Are there any questions before I switch? I added it. So. Okay. There's no one true universal UX. Programmers got to get this out of our head that every every problem has a good, specific, correct solution. UX isn't that way. We can solve any number of problems any number of different ways. So the way that you approach this this thing that really is kind of fundamentally uh, a difficulty within the problem solving process, you have to define your principles. So this is from uh, an article by Luke. Blues. I can only say his name when I'm not giving a talk. Loop W, it's super Polish. <laughs> um, it's called Developing Design Principles. So on the, the one side, you've got Facebook. They are universal, human, clean, consistent. I'm going to leave it up to you guys to determine how well they've gotten this done. But uh, these are their goals. They want to be useful to you. They want to be the same everywhere you are no matter what you're trying to do, no matter what device you're on. They want to be super fast. They want to be transparent. They don't want to surprise you. They want to get out of the way and let you do what your task at hand is. On the other hand, you've got HTC One. Uh, that's a particular phone that had a particular kind of branding associated with it. Their goal, make it mine. I want this super customizable. Mine is not like anybody else's. I want it to stay close. I want it to be personal. I want it to be only about me doesn't have to have my friends on it, doesn't have to have anybody else's preferences. And I want to discover the unexpected. They want to do something called tiny delights, which is actually a term. Tiny delights are you're using your phone and you swipe and there's a really cute little animation. You're like, oh, <laughs> that was joyful. <laughs> it's like that. You know, HTC One wants to, to have these little things in there that just make you go, oh, I didn't see that coming. That's totally opposed to how Facebook approaches their software. Neither one of those is more correct than the other. It's simply the principles that these two companies decided to apply to the software that they were making. So before you're going through with your software and trying to decide what is right, what is the correct way to do this, it can be helpful to decide what correct means for you. Decide what it means, uh, to whether, whether you want it to be consistent, transparent, whether you want it to be exciting and fun. They're kind of at odds with each other. A lot of these things are very different from each other on these lists. <laughs> Just decide which one's right for you. And then when you come to a fork in the road and you encounter these problems and you say, I don't know what to do, you come back to your, your principles and you use that as your rubric to make your decision. Don't reinvent the wheel. What's that? Shout it out. What does that do? Play button. Play button. Play button. That doesn't actually even do anything. We all know that. That is literally a graphic on my slide. But when we see it, we say, oh, it's video. I know what that is. There's no reason for you to get tricky or crafty or redo anything. You don't have to be the Picasso of interfaces. There's a lot of patterns out there. What you should be doing is looking at what other people are doing and doing that. Someone does something once, it's very original. Someone does, someone does it twice, that person stole. And if someone does it three times, it's a design pattern. So, steal liberally. 
when it comes to your interfaces. Steal when it comes to your interfaces as small components of it. Don't like steal their CSS. That's like way not cool. But <laughs> if they've got a thing that's communicating something to users, that's great. You don't want users to have to think. You don't want users to have to come to your site and figure out what it does. You want them to look at your site and just go, got it. Moving on. Uh, Jacob Nielsen has a rule that users spend 99% of their time on websites that aren't yours. So if you try to get too tricky, that's, that's sort of prideful, man. That hubris comes before a fall. You need to step back and just say, you know what, I want to get them in and out. You do that by reusing other people's patterns. Fortunately, devs are really good at this. It's like a requirement for the work we do is pattern matching. So we can look at what other people are doing and say, aha, I see that three other places. It's a design pattern. Now I'm going to use it. But what's really important is to pattern match usefully. Match usefully. So, which we all are. See patterns that aren't quite there. So, for example, oh, I'm sorry, my font went not so on this screen. Normally those are readable. Um, what we've got is this group of words. It says llama, lemur, olive, lemon, orange, orangutan, lollipop, octopus, ocelot, lynx, labrador, licorice. So, if I tell you to group them, you might first say, well, there's colors, so, you know, I'll put the green ones with. I'll put the green ones, the green ones and the orange ones. And that wouldn't be incorrect. It just wouldn't be useful. It just wouldn't be, well, there's a lot of L's and a lot of O's, so I can put those together. And also not incorrect, just also not really useful. What's useful is grouping them semantically. So now what we have is llama, lynx, lemur, ocelot, all the animals on the top, lollipop, lemon, foods on the bottom. And if you notice, bottom. And if you notice, right I'm in like extraordinarily tiny font, which I very much apologize for, says octopus. Octopus is a trick, because it's both an animal and a food. <coughs> but in this case, we can tell it's a food because it is grouped with the other foods. So this is a grouping, a pattern matching that is semantically useful. It communicates something to us. Similarly, when you're writing interfaces, this translates to grouping like with like. If you have actions next to the thing they act on, this translates to like different types of data, data, put the data together so people know they're a thing. This is a thing you're probably already doing intuitively, but sometimes you're going to come to a crossroad where you don't really think about it. And that's when it helps to have this rule spelled out, to have this rule as a thing that you already in, have in your pocket and intend to use. You need to protect your users. Be a good steward of them and their trust. So we already know someone wants to delete something, pop up a confirmation. Good. Sometimes what we do is the Gmail approach of you delete something, we let you do it, but then we pop up a thing and says, ah, did you mean to do that? Because here's an undo button. That counts too. That's also protecting your users. What we're a little worse at as devs is stuff for ourselves or stuff for other devs. That's when we start writing command line utilities where we're like, hey, this will clear out all of the records and the logs for a specific date. And I wrote it so that if you don't put a date in, it'll actually delete everything, but just so don't do that. <laughs> that is not protecting your user. Because even if when you write that, you go, I don't have time to finish this. I know, I know, I just won't do it. Like I, I wrote this for me, I won't do it. In three months, you're basically a different person. So the person you wrote that for no longer exists, now you're the new jerk that's gonna to forget to put a date on there and delete everything from the logs. So take this protect your users thing farther than just saying confirmation dialogue before you do something destructive. Try to think through to the end of it, even if who you're protecting is another dev who should know better. This also applies in designing code. When you're architecting, you, uh, you don't wanna write interfaces that are going to make it easy to do the wrong thing. And I mean, there's whole other talks there about this, but it's the same idea. So don't, don't get in too deep with expecting people to do the right thing and making it, don't punish them if they happen to do the wrong thing. It doesn't make you better than them, it kind of makes you a jerk. So don't do it. Also, don't expect people to read a dang thing, which is sort of ironic, I just realized, because I got words on my slides, but I'm saying them to you, so it's fine. <laughs> um, people don't read. If you need, this much text to explain your interface, 
your interface is crappy. That's your red flag, man. Take a step back and redo it. Sometimes step back and redo it. You are gonna sometimes you'll just chop out most of those words because they actually weren't necessary. Sometimes you'll take those words and just move them to where they're needed. Tool tips, help documentation. How much reading you can expect someone to do correlates with how technical the software you're writing is. So if you're writing accounting software or something that is for like a hospital scheduling system, that is super complicated software. And it's not wrong to assume that people have a little more training before they touch it. Similarly, APIs. APIs are a kind of software, man, we document the heck out of those. On the other hand, I'm just checking my email. If I'm just using your silly tool to uh, look up all of the health department ratings for the restaurants in your town, which is a thing that someone just released in Minneapolis and bless them for it, <laughs> I don't need a wall of text. I just need an interface that works. Um, actually, this totally just happened to me yesterday. This isn't like a comedian saying, hey, the funniest thing, like this really just happened to me. Um, we use track for our, our tickets. And for years, we have had this problem where if you upload a spreadsheet of tickets, It'll correlate based on the summary, which means if you've like ever used that, that instance of track ever once in the past, it just kind of like takes your new ticket and says, oh, we already have that one. You're like, no, you don't. I wanted a new one. Well, we found out that there's a way to make that not happen, basically. And we've, we've been suffering this with this for years. And it, there's like a, just a page of text on the page where you upload the, the tickets. And we always scroll right past it, get to the browse, upload the CSV and go home. Well, it turns out that right in there for two years have been instructions how to not make this happen. <laughs> and I found it out and I like, I like fell backwards with glee and I wrote a profanity laden email to all my coworkers and I was like, guys, look what I found. And they were like, oh my God, like it was amazing. And it has been staring us in the face for two years. So uh, yeah, people don't read anything, especially not us, I guess, but Normal people don't either, they just bail. They just wanna to get to their solution and they go. In fact, there's a lot of research that says that users pretty much do the first thing that works and then they never learn a new way to do anything. So if you have some path that is five clicks long and something about the path they were supposed to use, which is two clicks, was confusing, too hard for them to find, but they found this five path, five click path thing that works, they're gonna do that every time. They'll never look for a better solution. So when you want to be changing things, you have to be a little craftier than just putting a paragraph up that says, hey, we're changing stuff. No one's gonna read it. Users don't look for new solutions once they have them. They just go through. Another thing that's important is avoiding surprising behavior. This is probably the, t the tenant that I have to pull out most often when I'm designing. And I think that as devs, this is particularly hard for us because what we're really good at is conclusions, finding logical paths, saying if A then B then C then D then E then F. Well then clearly if A then F. This is a true path, this is a true thing. But for your user, they got pulled out of all of those steps. They never got to see B or C or D or E before they got to F and it just throws them off. A real example of this is we were writing software for uh, wholesalers. So we have a company that, um, they're a client, they sell glasses, super cute hipster little reading glasses, and they sell the wholesalers too. So we were making a wholesale site to accompany the uh, consumer facing site. And the wholesalers have a very different interface. It's a huge grid where they can just go tab, 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 tab. It's, it's really ugly, but incredibly efficient, which is, what we needed to do for them. However, when you're ordering in quantities like that, sometimes you want to order 140 glasses and we only have 70 in stock. So what we had to do is figure out how do we validate that? Because the way that this works is as they're tabbing through very quickly, we're validating on the fly. So we had to say, all right, well, we kind of have a, we have a few options here. We let you put what we have in stock in your cart. So you get 70 instead of your 140, we change the form and drop it in there. Or instead of your 140, we change Or we, in this very efficient process. And we decided, well, if you wanted to buy 140, but we only have 70, like you're gonna buy 70 because that's fine. You'll just sell what we have. And we don't wanna stop you going through really quickly because that's the main goal here. 
So what we did was we had the form just sort of automatically change it. If you type in 140, we've got 70, we would change it to 70 for you and, and save you that, that sort of jarring step. Users hated it. They hated it because then how 70 got in the picture. So even though we thought we were doing them a favor, we thought that we were making it easier on them, taking out these extra steps, not making them have to stop the flow they were going through, they just didn't like not knowing how they got there. And sometimes that's more important. They just didn't know how they got there. So we went back to a big nasty error message and you have to stop what you're doing. And I'm sure that some of them are annoyed by that, but it's clear that in the end, it's less weird than trying to take that away from them because it keeps them grounded. Breadcrumbs are the same idea. Breadcrumbs are the same idea. Breadcrumbs on a website tell you about there. So it's that principle just bigger. Don't surprise people. Don't try to be too clever. Don't try to be too helpful, which sounds really weird, but it's true. Finally, I think finally, watch people use your software and believe them. We're really bad at this, devs. Believe them. Bad at this stuff. Bugs. I did this, and we go. It's not a bug. You're using it wrong. <laughs> well, it's not a bug in the code, but it's a bug in your UX. So, when you get those things, try to resist the urge to be defensive, which is really hard because they're insulting your baby. But try not to be defensive. Try to hear what they're saying about. I had a problem with this. This is the kind of feedback that UX people literally pay people to give them. You're getting it for free when someone complains about your software. So try to take it in the spirit in which, well, not in which it was intended, but in which it can be useful. Hear what they're saying about what's not working about your user flow. Hear what they're saying about what's not um, helping them achieve their task, because ultimately software is a task-oriented enterprise. And if you can't achieve the task, the software is a failure even if it's not technically a bug. So take a step back, hear what they're saying, believe what they're saying. You don't necessarily need to change it. I mean, sometimes users are kind of less savvy and they're not your target user. And one person having a problem isn't necessarily enough to want to change your software, but hear them. Don't immediately dismiss it out of hand. So those are things that can be super helpful whether you are working uh, on a team, not on a team, on your very, very own, and you're doing a side project, or you're the only person in your office and you have to develop and design all of your UX, your uh, UIs, or if you're on a team, because just because the UX person gave you something doesn't mean that, I mean, it's perfect. Like you're gonna have to be working through it and making choices and seeing things. But if you are lucky enough to have UX people at your office, there are things that you can do to work better with them, more effectively with them. A developer's job is to think about how a developer's about how the UX. By that I mean, we are the ones who know about edge cases that the UX person maybe didn't encounter because we can't help but see them when we're writing the code. We also know where something might be slow. We know where the UX tried to design something that is just fundamentally incompatible with the realities of technology or with the kind of data we're collecting or where they want to do something and we're not collecting quite enough data to do it yet. So our jobs as devs is to take these requirements where the UX person says, this is my best guess. This isn't, this isn't the final, this isn't chiseled in stone. These are not commandments. So this is my best guess. And you have to take that and, and look into it and think about it from a user point of view. That's where we can be useful partners with the UX people in our lives. In fact, I spend a lot of time working with UX people. I am a technical lead on most of the projects I'm on at this point, which means I'm writing the requirements. And we never work in isolation. Technical requirements, UX requirements, very different documents. One's wireframes and Man, UX people have a lot of deliverables, guys. There's like 50 options on our checklist. And I just have one deliverable, more or less. It's a technical spec sheet. We sit in the same room and we work on them together because they, they inform each other. Sometimes if I'm lucky, actually, she does hers first. Uh, they're all she's at my office. She does hers first, and then I can write my requirements based off of it. But it is always collaborative because there's always room for me to find things that she didn't find 
or to suggest things that um, maybe she didn't come up with. So the best way to work with the UX pro is never to say no. They say, can I? And you go, nope. And someone says, can I? Go, yeah, but. So can we change this whole interface to do this or that? Well, yeah, but it's going to take 100 hours. So are you sure it's a great idea? Um, or can we add this? Well, yeah, but actually it's going to really reduce the security of it. So I don't think it's a good idea. The basic idea here is to give enough information to communicate to the UX person, not just this brick wall, but to say, this is why this is a problem. Um, and then you're in a position where you can be more collaborative. This is frankly a good way to work with pretty much anybody in life. It's a great one with clients too, but in this context, use it for your UX people. I actually had, um, I had a UX person once who, she comes to me, so we're on this project. This is a great way to keep yourself from getting screwed, basically. So this UX person comes to me and she says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. He was on this project for uh, this company that had a lot of effectively franchises. And so she said, we're gonna take all of the franchises, and I know this is gonna be really hard, I know, I wanna put them on a map with a marker for each location. And I'm like, oh, dude, we can do that. Stop freaking out. She's like, oh, thank God, okay, cool. Uh, and so then she flips the page to the next page in the UX. She goes, oh, and then here we're gonna have a search and the search is gonna be based on proximity. So like whatever one is closest to you will go at first and then so on. So that's not like a big deal. And then she moves past and I'm like, whoa, it's like actually a huge deal. And so we had to talk about geolocation and really complicated and rhythms that I still don't understand. Pace, the math. <laughs> <laughs> really confusing. <laughs> um, and you know all of these different things, and and she was like, oh my god, I didn't even think of that. And I was like, well, yeah, dude, I'm I'm. It's not quite as easy as it sounds. So what that meant was I got enough time to write that because in the end she said, you know what, this is their core feature. We got to do it. We got to do it. This is our core feature. And I said, okay, fine. That's the reality. This is what it's going to take to do it. On the other hand, she didn't have to walk around worrying about a GIF with dots on it. So it made both of our lives better. Know when it's over your head, though. We're still not trained on this stuff. I think you can do it. I think you should do it. Sometimes you probably shouldn't, though. Ask for help. But the most effective way to ask a UX professional for help is to take a stab at it first. So try to design that UX, even though you know it's going to be real bad. Try to design that UX and try to get your ideas out, because then you're speaking their language. Then you are going to them with something that is in a format they understand, and they understand the data that you have to do, and they kind of understand the problem you're solving. So it's a better tool than just going to them and being like, mm. try to design it out, swallow your pride, take a picture of the whiteboard, bring it to your UX person. And if you don't have UX people, that's fine. Grab your coworker, grab a friend, go to usertesting.com. I don't work for them. I just think their product is amazeballs, and I shill it every time I give a talk. For really cheap, you can get actual users to do your stuff. And the thing about user tests is that you don't need a lot. You don't need a fancy usability lab. Uh, Steve Krug, who wrote a book called Don't Make Me Think, which if you've never read a UX book, needs to be the book you read, Don't Make Me Think. Steve Krug, write it down. Um, he, in his book, says that in the vast majority of cases, all of the issues that they find in user tests came up in the first three. So after that, what you're getting is confirmation about which ones are the biggest and, and not such a big deal and stuff. But pretty much every issue that needed to be fixed found in free tests. So you don't need to go crazy on this. You just need a couple people to look at it and a little bit of discretion about what's good to fix and what's bad. Bottom line, guys, we're at the end. User's experience depends on everyone on the team. I think we're here to talk about the future of software. And the future of software is that it's everywhere. We're not getting into that it's everywhere. We're not getting less big responsibility to create software that is easy to use, that doesn't scare users, that doesn't trick them, that lets them accomplish their tasks and move on in their life because they're going to be interfacing with our products a lot for the rest of forever and relying on them to get what they're doing done. So don't live in a silo. Don't throw your UX over the fence. Be a part of the team. Make the software that you want to see in the world line. Thanks, guys. Be a part of the team software that you want to see. Thanks, guys.
have any questions? We have time for that. Hmm. He's going to come to you with the mic so everyone can hear. Um, so um, I, I work I work here at New Relic, and uh, I'm a front end ish kind of guy. And one of the challenges that we've been working on is um, the pace at which the technology moves is so rapid that I find that it's very easy for the UX or the design people to lose track of what's possible today because it's different than what was possible yesterday. How do you keep your design people on top of the tech? That's a really cool <laughs> question. Um, you know, in my case, they kind of keep themselves on top of it. Um, they're very active in reading industry publications, looking at Smashing Magazine, getting all of their design ideas kind of from those things and a lot of times they're pushing us they're going can we have this and we're like okay i know that's really cool and exciting but the reality is that took that person a very long time to do and we're not ready yet or in our cms because we have an in-house cms that we run most of our stuff on we're just not quite there on that specific thing if we do it this way it'll be a lot more efficient so in a lot of ways they're pushing us um but i i think that's where being user-minded comes in as a dev because they do sometimes come to me and say, all right, here's the UX. And I'm like, I know actually you'd rather have it this way because you've asked me for that before. Or I just read this cool thing and I'd love to do it this way. And I'm presenting an idea rather than just taking in blindly their ideas. So that collaboration, I think, is a very important part of it. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, are there any like libraries or um, like, oh, yeah, sorry. Hey, um, are there any libraries or prepackaged um, bundles or anything that you can use as a developer to get your UI off the ground other than just um, making it up on a whiteboard? Yeah, I, so I think a whiteboard is like the most underrated prototyping tool ever. But that said, there are a few different things. If you use a tool like Basalmic or other online wireframing tools, they come with libraries of elements that can kind of trigger your memory of like, oh, right, yeah, we already solved this one. I'm just not thinking about it right because I'm too deep in it. Um, Yahoo actually has a really awesome design pattern, like UI design pattern library um, that you, if you really want to dig in and be nerdy about it, there's other sites that have that too. And a lot of companies will sort of put their internal version of like their library online just for anyone to peruse. Another good thing is like things like Twitter Bootstrap. That's pretty much what I use because it comes with so many elements in it already and so many things that are kind of suggestive in the way that they're named. Um, that can be a really nice way to be like, okay, like I'm getting some of the some of the unnecessary intellectual work out of the way so that I'm a little more free to think about what what I might be able to do with this. So those three things would be my suggestion. Anyone else? <clears throat> Uh, we hear a lot of jokes about like the Yo app, you know, is a kind of a waste of time or whatnot. But do you think that uh, interfaces? Do you think that interfaces are going to go in that direction where they're dead simple and it just one button, two buttons? You don't really have to. So the the first part of the question was referencing Yo app, which is like literally a button. Um, I think the fact that that app took off, even though it does nothing, <laughs> speaks to what people want on a number of levels. And some of it is just people thought that was funny. So that's- Have you used it? I have not. Nope, I have not used it. It actually does a lot once you get into it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I've only read about it. Um, but the I think that it speaks to something that resonated with people, basically. That it is really simple. I mean, when you also look at like, um, Instagram picked up partly just because there was no good, simple way to share things, you know, share pictures. There's a lot of no good, simple things, you know, it suddenly solves this need. Even really realize how much friction we were experiencing with it. Um, so I, I think what's going to happen is that UI is going to kind of catch up to where it should have been. Like things that have been unnecessarily full of friction are going to get easier, but there are some tasks that are always going to be tricky. Some things are always going to be more complicated. So not that complexity will, not that complexity will but I think that as a whole, some things are going to get nicer and easier and better because also the web is at a place, technologically speaking, where it can support it. I mean, for a while, we just had white backgrounds, black text, and forms, you know. So we're also getting to a point where 
things will interact in a much easier way. So yeah, I, I kind of think we're going to see some of that. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be around for a while. So if you have any questions, you just want to chat, come up here and uh, say hi. Otherwise, thanks and enjoy your pizza.